The Sound and the Fury, the tragic tale of the downfall of the once distinguished Compson family. Please note that the following information does not appear in the order as told in the book. The Compson family, once a proud family of businessmen, governors, and generals, was now crumbling to pieces. First of all, we have Jason III, the father of the Compson children, who was an alcoholic. Their mother, Miss Caroline Bascom, wasn't much better, as she was constantly worried about her image and family name instead of acting as an actual mother to her children. So instead of their parents, the four children, Quentin, Caddy, Jason, and Benji, were primarily raised by Dilsey, the head of the family of black servants who helped the Compson family. The children all had their issues. Caddy, the daughter of the Compson family, became quite promiscuous, which negatively affected her brothers in many ways. Benji, the mentally handicapped son of the Compsons, didn't put much subjective thought into what he observed and was completely unaware of the concept of time. Benji seemed to freak out whenever he noticed the change, especially when he noticed Caddy had been behaving promiscuously, which he picked up on through what she smelled like. Benji had quite an interesting way of sensing the world around him. Quentin was obsessed with family honor, morals, and all those good old Southern traditions, which made him constantly haunted by the endless ticking of time and Caddy's deviation from his important values. Finally, Jason was a racist, sexist, money-crazed cynic who thought and behaved in an extremely heartless fashion. So what all went down? Well, to start, Caddy, who had been starting to get around with a few men, ended up pregnant with an illegitimate child. This caused both Benji and Quentin to freak out. In their own ways, of course. Benji was distraught over change and losing Caddy, which made him constantly bellow. Quentin, who was clearly troubled by Caddy's disregard for morals and losing her virginity, which he valued above all else, decided to take one for the team and tell his father that Caddy's child was his. His goal was to do that and then leave town with Caddy, but Caddy was not on board with that plan. And neither was their father, who knew Quentin was lying about committing incest, despite Quentin's desperate attempts to make him believe they had. Although he was an alcoholic, Mr. Compson was very philosophical and tried to reason with Quentin on how Caddy's virginity being lost was not that big of a deal, quite the progressive thought, and how saying that they committed incest was probably going to make the situation worse. Smart man. To try to help Quentin, Mr. Compson sent him to Harvard with the money that he got from selling Benji's pasture, the last of the once vast Compson land, except the main house and the servant's house. Additionally, Mr. Compson used that money for Caddy's wedding. That's right, Caddy tried to cover up her illegitimate pregnancy by a quick marriage to a banker, Herbert Head. Herbert even promised Jason a job at the bank he worked for. Things were really starting to look up for the Compsons, with Caddy married, Jason having a job set up, and Quentin going to Harvard. That was until Herbert found out about the child and divorced Caddy, leaving Jason without that job. On top of that, Quentin, still distraught about Caddy and tormented by the endless ticking of time, committed suicide by jumping into a river right after finishing his first year at Harvard. Caddy was disowned from the Compson family right after giving birth. Her child, Miss Quinton, not to be confused with her uncle Quinton, was taken from her to be raised in the Compson household, which was now under the control of Jason as Mr. Compson had passed away. But being disowned and taken from her child did not stop Caddy from sending Miss Quinton letters and money. However, Jason, who was still bitter at Caddy for messing up the job he had set up with Caddy's ex-husband, never let Miss Quinton see the letters Caddy had sent her. On top of that, the ever-stingy Jason stole the money that was intended for Quentin, and it was no small sum of money. He estimated that he had taken around $50,000 over the past 18 or so years that Caddy had been sending money. That would be over $600,000 in today's time. But of course, Jason didn't think he was doing anything wrong. In his eyes, Quentin didn't deserve the money because she was just going to waste it on skimpy clothes and makeup. So yes, Quentin was very promiscuous, just like her mother, perhaps even more. But Quentin blamed her behavior on Jason, who for one, took her money and treated her like dirt, and for two, was completely overbearing in many ways, including following her around all the time. Eventually, Miss Quinton decided enough was enough, stole all the money Jason had buried in his room, and left town with a man wearing a red tie. Furious at losing around $7,000, especially to a girl, and even worse to that girl, 
Jason tried to track down Quentin and the man with what was most likely the intention of murder, as he was absolutely livid, and really getting the money back was impossible. It was her money to begin with. While Jason was out looking for Quentin, Dilsey was at church with the other servants and Benji. There she realized that she had seed the first and the last. In other words, Quentin leaving was finally the end of the Compson family.